So this week we are talking about decision making. Um, that's that's a lot of what we are going to do from now until the end of class is about making decisions and having Python make the decisions in a predictable way. And you're going to tell Python how to make those decisions. Making decisions as a human, you know, is the sky blue, is the sun bright, is it raining outside, those all make sense to us. But they make absolutely no sense to a computer because a computer is a binary machine. It has two states, on and off. True and false, yes or no, however you want to put them, there's only two answers. There's no middle answer. So we have to learn how to write questions in a way that a computer can answer them with true or false, and we can still get the information that we need. So that's what this work that's what this week is about. And let's talk about a little bit of a background and where we're headed. So this week is really the first week in understanding how to write an algorithm. An algorithm is just a procedure for solving some computational problem. Um, think your game. Think any lab. They are all, you are developing algorithms. And to do that, we have to be able to have a computer make a decision. So by decision, if you know you're playing a game and you send your game you send your player to the right by hitting a button on that game console, the computer has to know that it's going to go to the right. And then what's going to happen if it goes to the right? Is it going to be eaten by a hobgoblin or is it going to go over a rainbow? Um, so so that's really where we're going. This week we're doing decision and branching. This is the basic foundation of an algorithm. Module four is looping, which is making decisions repeatedly with the data changing. Module five is functions, and that's kind of about encapsulating, writing an algorithm and putting it into something that you can name. Module six is data structures, and data structures are important because you don't just have a single variable. You have databases and oodles and oodles of information, and you have to manage them in some structured way to be able to make sense out of them. Module 7 is data storage. It's file handling. And 8 is object-oriented programming, which is kind of taking all the other stuff and packaging it into, again, something with a name. So this week, we've got some new keywords and some new concepts. We have three new keywords. And in this module, we introduce the keywords with an order. So we have if, elif, and else. And you see order to the left on this slide. The order is the order in which they have to appear. If, if you're making a decision, if always has to appear first. You can't have an elif or an else if there's no if statement. If doesn't have, you don't have to have anything else. You don't have to have an elif. You don't have to have an else, but you have to have an if. If you want to make multiple related decisions, you're going to use an elif. And if all else fails, you'll use an else. So we also have some new operators. They're called relational operators, and they check two values against each other. Up until now, we've had arithmetic operators. And those operators have been multiplication, division. We have a single equal sign. And I know that um, I, I think students get tired of me saying a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Well, now we're getting to the double equal sign, which is why I always say single equal sign. The double equal sign is equivalent to. So it's not an assignment. It's not saying take this value and put it into a variable. What it's saying is compare two things. Compare which is on, what is on my left-hand side to what is on my right-hand side, and tell me whether they're the same thing. 
We also have inequality operators, so an exclamation point with an equal sign right after it is not equivalent to. So are they not the same? We have less than, less than, or equal to, greater than, or greater than, or equal to. Same thing. They're checking the value, two values against each other to determine if they are, um, how they are related. So we have some new Boolean operators. We have and, we have or, and we have not. And says, all my trues and false are all true. Everything comes out to true. Or says, if one thing comes out to true, they're all true. Not says, it's the opposite of. Now, there are good times to use not. I try uh, to write my statements in such a way where I don't have to use not, but sometimes I do. So there are two Boolean values, true and false. That's it. Those are the only answers that you get to have to your questions. And I don't know if I put this in another slide or not, but I'll say it here. Computers are stupid because they, can, they only can have true or false. That's it. There is no middle ground, there's no in-between, so you have to remember that a computer is as stupid as a light switch. And I'm not talking about a dimmer switch, I'm talking about the old, you know, the old up is on, down is off, or down is on, up is off, whatever. But that's what a computer is. So you're programming for a light switch. It's a lot of light switches that can do all kinds of things very fast, but it's still a light switch. So I've talked a little bit about scope uh, in module one. I'm going to talk about it now because scope becomes massively important right now. What does scope dictate? Scope basically says, when is a piece of code available to use? Up until now, Everything we've done is in what's called the global scope, which means everything's available to everything all the time. What we're really introducing this week is something called the local scope. So a local scope is code that is defined inside of a branch or inside of a class or inside of a function, and it is only available inside that branch or class or function. It doesn't exist. Python won't even acknowledge it until you actually enter that function or enter that branch. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a couple of slides. But you have to remember that we're dealing with two things. And the way Python determines this is by the spacing of your program. One of the things that I find frustrating about Python is that if you have a line even one space off, you're going to get syntax errors or you're going to get runtime errors. So we have to make sure that our indentations are very exact so that we know when so and Python knows when something is in the local scope and something is in the global scope because you can easily create a logic error won't even be a syntax error. Python will run just fine. The program will not do what you want because something is not spaced right. So decisions in the computer world. All decisions are a comparison between values. And a decision has to have an outcome. There's no, eh, maybe. It has to have an outcome. So. What you're really doing in a computer is you're comparing two memory spaces. Now, from the first couple of weeks, we know that when we define a variable, you've got the name of the variable and the value, and they're related in computer memory. The same thing is happening with when you compare them. What Python is doing is it's going to the computer memory associated with the variable name, and it's pulling that value out and saying, compare these two. So, for example, I have num1 and num2. Uh, now I have this if after num1 and num2 in the Python script. I have if num1 less than num2 colon. 
So what Python is doing here is it's physically going to the space in RAM and saying 42 less than 18. And, um, and if 40 less, 42 is less than 18, then I'm going to print num1 is small. The way I read this comparison, because we always teach you how to write programming, but we don't teach you how to read it. The way you can read this comparison is 42 is less than 18, true or false. All branching statements are just like the true-false questions you used to have on tests. So let's go back into some syntax formatting and scope. So this is challenge 3.2.2, and we'll look at this in a few minutes in PyCharm. I have a variable called user age. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I'm going to get some input from the user and turn it into an int. We've been doing that for two weeks. That's not new. Now, after that, I have this new keyword, if. I am checking the value in the variable user age against 18, and that check is a less than check. So if I look at this, I can see what's in the global scope. User age, if, and else are all in the global scope. They're in the global scope because they are all left justified. And when we look at this in PyCharm, it'll become a little clearer. The print 18 or less or print over 18 is in the local scope. You can tell it's in the local scope because it's indented. And um, it's that line is only going to happen if your your statement evaluates to true. Else, on the other hand, will only be activated. That print over 18 will only ever get to that line of code if everything else associated with that with that else, which is in this case just that above if statement. If Everything else is false. Okay. So I have if and else, which is a keyword. If tells Python it is time to make a decision. Else tells Python that it's not really time to make a decision. It's that all the decisions have been made and they were all false. Uh, the, the statement reads user age is less than 18. Um, the colon tells Python to end the statement. It's like a question mark. So, whoops. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back for just a second. So, the colon here is like a question mark. It tells Python to end the statement. You have to have that colon. If you don't have that colon, Python's going to give you an error. It has to start with if, elif, or else. That, ha that line of code has to end with a colon. And it all has to be on one line of code. So, hold on. Go here. Scope, indentations matter. So, like I said, Python is a, a space delimited language. If I look at the blue line, the blue line is the, is, is the far left of where you can type in PyCharm. If I look at the orange line, the orange line is indented one. It's like I hit the tab. And this is how you know something when you're reading a program that something is in a different scope than the global scope. It is tabbed in one. And by the way, you can use spaces my suggestion is always use tabs because you'll never, the, the tabs will always put things in the right place. And if you have, and I'll show you in a minute, if you have a line out of place, bad things will happen. Um, so let's look at some rules. 
Uh, local scopes are separate and know nothing about other local scopes. So what is inside the if statement, which by the way is line 7 and 8, knows nothing about line 10. And I'll show you how Python reads this and I think it will become a little clearer. A program can have multiple local scopes. You can have nested local scopes as well. For every branch keyword, if, elif, or else, there is a separate local scope. And this is going to start getting a little more complex when we start looking at where variables are available. Um, computers aren't smart. Oh, let's go back and look at 322. Uh, oops, yes. In our course, we are on Module 2. Oh, what, what week is it? Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. You're right. I don't know why I was thinking it was Module 3. I'm going to start up Module 3, Module 2 right now, and we will go back and do that. I was reviewing my slides and just completely got out of order. I apologize for that. Let me go out and do that. My goodness, we're on strings this week, people. Thanks for the reminder. I'm here going off on next week's stuff. Okay, so module two, this is lecture two. Thanks for being understanding, everyone. You're not in the wrong session. Okay, let me open up module two here. Uh, open three, two, let me open up two, module two. Okay, we're just going to start again and pretend that didn't happen. I'll try and cut that off before, before we start, when I, when I upload the video. So let's start this again. We're going to do module two. Where's my keynote? Module two. There's my module two. Okay. Let's go back and start this again. This week is module two, everyone. We are talking about strings and a little bit about lists. We have to understand lists because a string is a list. So we're going to talk a little bit about lists, but it's just the beginning. When we get to uh, six, when we get to data structures, we're going to talk all about lists. So this is just enough about lists to understand a string. So we have two new concepts. We uh, have string and list. And I don't know why I have slice under concept. Slice is a function. We'll get to that. A string is a container for data. A list is a container which allows multiple data elements. So basically, a string is a list. Um, we have a couple more concepts. We have the concept of del, which is delete an element from a list or delete the whole list. And we also have some new syntax, which is the left. It, which is the square brackets, the left square bracket and the right square bracket, and that is an indicator to Python that it's dealing with a list. Oops. All right, so we have some new functions. These functions have been chosen because most likely you're going to have to use them in a lab. Split, it creates, creates a list from a string. Get used to split, you will be using it for the rest of the class. Find, return the number of times a character appears in a string. You're going to be using this for a lab. When it says, tell me the number of times a certain character occurs in a string, in a lab, you're going to use the font. Uh, sorry, you're going to use count. Find says, I don't know why I did that. I apologize. We're just going to get rid of this. This should be count. Okay, we're just going to start again. I'm having a good evening. Replace. Replace creates a new string from an existing string and replaces the characters in the process. Count is count the number of times characters appears in a string. 
remove removes an element from a list and format creates a new string from an existing tree, string which contains format specifiers. Okay, what is a string? A string is an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. Most importantly, a string is immutable. Immutable means you're not allowed to change it. You cannot change a string. You can have Python create you a new string from an old string and have that new string have changes in it. But you cannot modify a string, period. When you see it, that's the way it is. So just like last week when we were talking about variables and, and RAM, a string is just a place in RAM and it has some number of characters in order. What's not a string? Okay, what you see in your script, this is a string, Python sees a syntax here. It's missing a close quote. This is a string, open, double quote, close, single quote. Again, it's a syntax error. This is a string and this is a syntax error because there is a double quote inside of two double quotes. Python doesn't know what to do with this. It says this is a space is the string and then string and colon it doesn't know what to do with. So rule for every quote open quote, you have to have a closing quote of the same type. Now, it doesn't matter. You can have a single quote open and a single quote to close a string. You can have a double quote to open and a double quote to close a string. So those are interchangeable, but they just have to match. So a quick and easy way to correct those syntax errors. So basically, if it doesn't have a quote, you add it. If it has a opening quote and then a closing quote that isn't the right type, you change it. And for the case in which you have to have quotes in a quote, you will do something called backslash. You'll, you'll escape it with backslash character. Now, there's also an easier way to do this, which is if you need to have like a last name that's O'Donnell, and there's an apostrophe after the O, just put that the, the rest of the string in double quotes and have the apostrophe as where it needs to be, and it'll be fine. Okay, let's look at order. How does Python order it? Well, what I see is Meister. Meister is a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The value of Meister is this is a string. And what the computer memory has in it is this is a string with all the spaces. Now, Python keeps a hidden index for every string and actually every list. And this, it's not something that you see, but it's something that we get to use. We get to use it to figure out what is in the string and to understand what the order of the values are. And this becomes important when you potentially want to create a new string from an existing string by replacing the care, you know, replacing I with A, with E, with, with whatever. So that's what ordered is. And because Python is a list and because, well, all lists are ordered. Not all lists are immutable. The string is immutable. OK. You read this hidden index like this. T is at index 0. H is at index 1. I is at index 2. And by the way, all lists start with an index value of zero. It drives some people crazy. Why didn't they start it at one? But it, it makes the math a little odd when you start to calculate out where things possibly are. So you have to remember, and you can't change it. 
lists start at index 0. Strings, because they're lists, start at index 0. Um, every character in a string has a numerical placeholder. We're going to call it that our index. So let's talk a little bit about lists, and then we're going to go back to strings. A list is an ordered collection of elements. And I didn't say characters because a list can contain strings. It can contain an integer. It can contain a float. It can contain a Boolean. It can contain another list. It can contain a dictionary. It can contain all kinds of things. Um, lists are mutable, which means they can be changed. So when I am dealing with the syntax for a list, I am going to have a square, a square left bracket followed by an element. In my Python script here, I have quote Lisa end quote, so I have a string Lisa. I have the number 42 and I have 3.14. And my variable is just like any other variable. The rules for variable naming don't change. They are completely the same as they were last week. I know my list is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. My list just happens now to be assigned the value that is a list. And I'm, you know, something that I don't have to keep track of in my program is that index, the index we get for free. Um, when you define a list, you, def you have to separate the elements by comma. There's no other value, no other character you can use that has to be a comma. So Lisa has to be separated by a comma between it and 42, and 42 is separated by, from the next element by a comma. Okay, so a list starts with an open square bracket. It ends with a closing square bracket. I can create an, a list with data and without data. Um, elements are separated by commas. I said all this last slide. Got ahead of myself. OK, what can I do with a list? I can do CRUD, create, read, update, delete. We're going to use this acronym a lot in this class because that's really what you can do. You can create a list. You can read a list, you can update a list, you can delete a list. You can do most of that with a string. You can't really update it, but you can do the C, R, and D. And with lists and dictionaries, you can do the same thing. So to create a list, I can create either an empty list that's populated or an empty list that's empty. Or sorry, a list that's empty. So an empty list, I just don't have anything in between the brackets. For a populated list, like we saw in the last couple of slides, I will have a left open square bracket. I will have some number of elements separated by a comma. And I will have a closing right square bracket. OK. So OK. So I know, I know we have an index. I know I can do CRUD. I can create it. I can read it. I can update it and delete it. Well, how does that, that index affect how to read it? Because I have this variable called my list, and I want to know what the second element in that list is. How do, what, what's the syntax for that? So what the syntax is, it, um, I have a variable called my list. It was defined in the Python script. When I go to access a value in the list, I'm going to use the index, that invisible number. So if I say my list, open square bracket, the index number, close square bracket, I will get the index number. I will get the value at that index number. Or I will get an exception thrown because it doesn't exist. So you have to be careful. And you'll notice that when I said my list of 0, open square bracket, 0, close square bracket, I got the value Lisa. Again, 
all indexes start at zero. So if I want to know what the first in the value of the first element in my list is, I have to use zero. Okay. Uh, CRUD U is update or change a list. So that's all update is. It's going to change the list. So what I have here is I have my list. I have Lisa 42 3.14. Same as the last slide. I'm going to print my list of one and it's going to come out and it's going to say, okay, 42. Now on the next line, I'm saying my list of one equals 25. What I have done is I have taken, I have told Python the second element in my list, so the element that is at index 1 is now supposed to be replaced with 25. So I just updated my list. My list is no longer Lisa 42 and 3.14. It is now Lisa 25 and 3.14. And we'll do this and then we'll look at a script. Um, another way, there's actually a lot of different um, a lot of different functions that Python gives you just by being Python. And so that you can modify scripts in different ways. What we're dealing here with is a function called append. So I have my list equal Lisa 42 and 3.14, and I want to add an element to the end of that list. Now, when we look at my list here, we have my list dot append added. This is one of the first times we're using a dot notation. So the dot between my list and append tells Python, execute this function against the thing to the, to the left of the dot. So in this case, it's saying, hey, Python, add the word added to the end of my list. That's how you read that. And when you see a dot notation, that dot always means act, whatever action you're doing, do it on the thing to the left of the dot. So my list is the same as it was before. And now I'm going to append to my list. And my list is now going to be four elements because I've added the word added. And now if I print my list of three, it's going to get the word added and it's going to print added. So I can delete as well. I can delete an element given an index number or I can delete the whole list. The way I do this is I use the del keyword and I simply say, hey, Python, delete the element at zero for my list. So it's going to get rid of Lisa and it's going to be 42 and 3.14. But what you have to remember is it's going to renumber. So 42 doesn't stay at index one. 42 Gets the index of 42 gets changed to zero, and so every other one will be minus one if you remove an element. Um, delete, you can also use remove to remove the first element matching a value. So let's say I just want to get rid of the first element that has a value of 42. I just use the remove function. Again, this is that dot notation. This dot notation says, hey, Python, this action remove that I want to do for 42, do it on my list. So change my list. So in this case, what you'll see is 42 goes away. We now have a list of two elements. Lisa is still 0, but 3.14 becomes 1. So when you are modifying your list like this, you have to remember the indexes are going to change. All right, so there's a little script out here called crud.py that goes through all of this. Did I just change that slide? I did. There we go. 
Okay. Okay, crud.py, here we go. So this is just an example of what we have done. But I want to break it in a couple of ways. Um, first, let's just debug it, because we all know I like the debugger a lot. And for those who weren't here last week, this is PyCharm. Um, one of the things that I find excellent about PyCharm is the debugger. And what the debugger allows me to do is walk through the code. And even next week you'll see how that can really help you determine where you are and what's going on. So in PyCharm, to run the debugger, I go up here and, oh, sorry. First of all, I have to make sure I have the right configuration selected. And right now I don't, so I am going to choose the file I want to run, and then I'm going to go to the first little bug here, and I'm going to say debug crud. Now, why didn't it debug? Ah, step through, I'm sorry, step through crud. Okay, what's going on? So, we're going to stop this. It's just not running. It should have been this one. Why isn't the debugger running? Okay, we're going to try this again. There we go. My apologies. I don't know why I had to put the breakpoint at 4. PyCharm was not being friendly. So, as a, just a review from last week, if you click to the right, of the number in PyCharm, you'll get a red dot, and that red dot is a breakpoint. A breakpoint says, Python, stop here before you execute the line. So in this case, I have defined a list called empty list. Now some of the nice things about PyCharm and debugging is it's going to tell you here what empty list is. And right now empty list is just an empty list but it could also tell you if you are stepping through a more complex problem, you could watch values change, which can be very helpful when you're dealing with loops. So I'm going to print my empty list, and down here in the console, I'll see that. So there are two tabs here. There's console and there's debugger. Console is just a, like a text screen that you're typing into or that you're getting information out of. Um, the closest thing I can remember when, I, when I've been playing with chat GPT and I've been sitting there typing in commands and it's been talking back to me, that's, that, that's the thing that feels closest to a text editor and a text interface for a computer. This, this program is nothing like AI, but that's kind of what it reminds me of. Anyway, the debugger tab has lots of nice little information especially over here under the evaluate expression. It has basically what your values, what your variables that have been defined already and your values are. Now we'll, we'll see here that I've defined something called my empty list and I printed it so I know it's an empty list. Now, because I stepped over line four, I'm on line seven, but you'll notice down here that I don't have a my list. And that's because Python has not yet executed Module 7. So I'm going to step over Module 7, and it will, you will see here my list got added. Now I am going to print out the values from my list. So I have Lisa, 42, 3.14. I'm going to go back to the console. I'm going to print out Lisa of 0, which is my list of 0. My list of 1, which is um, 42, and my list of 2, which is 3.14. Now you'll notice, by the way, up here that I have stir. Um, so remember that you do have to do conversions if you're concatenating two strings together with the plus. You have to make sure that everything is a string. 42 is not a string here because there's no quotes around it. 
42 is an int. 3.14 is not a string because there are no quotes around it. It is an int. So what I have to do is I have to make Python know that I want it to be as a string by using the stir function. And that's just a little review from last week. Also, if I go back here to the debugger, you will see what they are. So you'll notice that I drop down my list and I have zero is a stir, one is an int, and two is a float. So that's another way Python can help you. It can help you tell you what the type is. So now I want to change my list. So let's just look down here. I'm on line 16, and by the way, just as a refresher from last week, the dark blue line is the line I'm about to execute. So I'm going to step over that, and if we look under evaluate expression, you will see that 42 is now 25. And I'm going to print my list. I'm going to go over here to the console, which is just going to now do Lisa 25 3.14. So now I'm going to append the word add. So I'm going to go back to the debugger. Right now we have three elements in my list. If I step over, I now have a fourth element in my list. And when I print it, it's going to have that. Now there's a couple other functions you can do. There's something you can do a pop. A pop will simply pop an element off the list. So if I look at the debugger, you will see that I have Lisa 3.14 and add there because I already stepped over the pop. I'm going to print my list and now I'm going to remove add. I'm going to remove the first thing with the word add in it. So now I have two elements and I'm going to print my list. So let's look at something. Let, uh, let me just do this. I'm going to print my list of three. Whoops, I don't want the zero there. I have three elements in a list. Why shouldn't I be able to print my list of three? When I execute this, I get index out of range. This is a common mistake that I see new students make. And the mistake basically is, well, 3.14 is my the third element in my list. Why can't I put three? You can't put three because this is zero. So it's always going to be 0, 1, 2. If you have an, if you get an error like this when you are doing your labs, go back and remind yourself that everything starts at 0. Sometimes you're going to have to count 0, 1, 2. Just remember that. So that is a gotcha that you want to be careful. If I want the last element in the list, it's really the length of the list minus 1. So in this case, it's would be two. So let's go back and all right. Why did we just talk about list? Because a string is a list. Um, you can do almost everything to a string that you can to a list. You can create a string, you can read a string, and you can delete a string. You cannot directly update a string, but Python gives you a whole host of functionality to create a new string from an old string. So I can create an empty string, just like I could create an empty list. In this case, an empty stir is just between two quotes. A populated string is just a letters and numbers between two quotes. If I want to read a string, it's the same way as I do in the list. So if I want, if I have my stir, I'm going to print zero. It's going to go out. It's going to go and say, okay, I have the character T at values at uh, index zero. It's then going to say, okay, give me the value at index 10, and that's an S. So that way it behaves the same as the list. When you're reading it, it's exactly the same. However, when you're updating it, it's not going to be the same because you have, you're going to create a new string from an old string. So one of the biggest things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to put that new string into a variable. 
So the way this works is I have Meister, um, same one we've seen, but I want to create a new string. And there are bunches of different ways to do it. In this case, I'm going to use a technique called slicing. And slicing says take the, these indexes and put them into a new string. So in this case, I'm saying my new stir is going to equal my stir. And then I have the left square bracket. Now I have a number, a colon, and another number. That's certainly not reading an index. What that is saying is get me every character starting at index 10 going to index 12. So it is non-inclusive of the last number. Again, this can be maddening because you think, hey, I'm going to get 10, 11, 12, and 13. You're not. You're going to get 10, 11, and 12. So you always have to remember that that last number has to have a minus 1 in your brain because it will only get you 10, 11, and 12. And my new stir is a brand new string. It's a new place in memory. It is not, it's not changing the place for my stir in memory. It's creating a new place in memory. And it's just going to have, in this case, S, T, and R. Um, yeah, the end index is not inclusive, but the starting index is. All right, let's look at a few string methods. So we have a find, and a find just says, get me the index number the first time you see a lowercase s. And in this case, it's index 3. So it's the fourth element in the list. And if I want to replace a portion of the string, I can use a replace function against the stir. This is, again, that dot notation. So what this is doing is say, Python, use the replace functionality and replace the characters this with the characters that and do it against my stir. So what will happen is Python will send you back a brand new string with the word, with the, the first four characters changed to that. And then we want to count the number of occurrences in a string of a given character. In this case, it's a lowercase i, and it's going to count the number, and it's going to give me back the number, which is going to be 3. 1, 2, and 3. And by the way, you do have to use count in a lab this week. So let's take a look at, uh, okay, we'll do string joining, and then we're going to look at a couple of PyCharm files. So, I'm going to split a string. Separate a string into a list using a delimiter. Okay. So this is splitting, not slicing. What this does is if I want to change, I, I've got a string, and that string has a delimiter. In this case, it's a comma. And I want to make that string be a list, I can split it. And you're going to have to do this in a uh, lab this week. And I can tell it what to split on. And again, split is one of the functions that uses the dot notation. So we're saying, hey, Python, take the contents of my stir and split it into a list every time you see a comma. Every time you see a comma, make a new element. So that's what it does. It's got first and second. That's what my list is now going to be. And again, split will create something new. So you're going to have to, the result of a split has to go into a variable. So you have to assign it when you're splitting it. Now you can go the opposite way. You can join it by using the join. Now this one's a little different because we're not acting on 
my list, what we're doing is we are creating a string, but we have to give it a string to start with. It's a little weird. So the way you deal with a join is you do the dot notation on an empty string. So you're going to have this empty string dot join my list. So my list will be joined and you'll just have a string with first and second. Now I didn't add any spaces so there's no spaces there. Uh, string formatting. Let me go off and do a simple string. Okay, so here we have some things and also where is it um, slice examples if you need some work with slicing this will be up we won't necessarily do this right now but this will this is all the um, shorthand stuff you can do with slicing but let's go into simple string and uh, let's do this okay simple string where are you simple split simple string okay so this is just a few things you can do with a string we're just we talked about the print we've talked about the slicing there are different kinds of slicing you can and I'll just debug starting there okay oh so let's just continue on where's my continue button there's my continue button so I'm on line 11 and what I've got so far is I've got this is a string and then I print the first character of the string out then I slice this is just what it I did in the slide um, but now I'm on this new line and I don't have a second number I have just one number and it's just eight colon and what this tells Py, Py, the Python to do is starting at character eight all the way to the end make a new string so that's what it gives me it gives me my new stir with a string in it and I'm going to print my new stir and then this time I'm going to say my new stir is equal to my stir but there's no beginning number and if there's no beginning number it's telling Python to start at zero now I could have put a zero there but I don't have to put a zero there so in that case my new stir becomes this and so there's the find I've replaced this with that in the slides length I want to know how long something is len is a function you're going to use it a lot in the rest of this class and it tells me the number of characters in a string and it is specifically used on strings and lists so if I want to continue on till here I have Meister and I if I look here and I look at Meister I see I can count them I could sit here and physically count them but I don't have to Len is going to tell me that so the outcome of Len is always an integer and you're going to want to usually set that into some variables so you're going to want to have a variable on the left hand side of that and a single equal sign and in this case the length is 16. Uh, let's go back and I apologize for my faux pas earlier because we are going to end up going late but it's not too too much longer so the format function so you can do this a lot of different ways um, but string formatting the way we're doing it in this example helps readability of the code um, I find pluses and pluses and pluses 
difficult. And also, if you're dealing with a lab that says you only can print the last two decimal places, this is how you have to do it. So what I have is a parameterized string. So I have a print statement. We've, we've seen print statements last week. And it's I'm, and then there's this open and close squiggly brace. And it's an open squiggly brace, colon dot two F, close squiggly brace, and then another open and close squiggly brace. What in the world is this? I don't want to print those little squiggly braces. What I want to print is I want to print Meister or num1 or float or some float. And what I am doing here is I am using positional arguments in the dot format function. So here's that dot notation again. I have a string to the left and I'm using dot format. So what I'm telling Python is saying, okay, on this string to the left, there's going to be some format specifiers, and I want to then put the values that you're passing into me into those format specifiers. Blah, sorry, format specifiers. So uh, an open and closed squiggly brace is a placeholder. So you can have placeholders, and you can have placeholders with things that tell you exactly how to format. The middle one there, the colon dot 2F, is just the notation that you have to use, and it is telling Python, hey, restrict this to two decimal places. Restrict the float to two decimal places. So if I have calculated pi out to the 99th, 99th decimal place, um, but I only want to print two, I can just truncate it, and it will only print 3.14 instead of 3.14 up to the 99th decimal place. OK. A couple of rules. The number of placeholders inside the string must equal the number of arguments in the format function call. So. I have three pairs of squiggly braces. I have to have three arguments in my format function. And they have to be in the right position. OK. And they have to be in the right position. OK, this is going to show us what I was just talking about. All right, so here's an example. I have three variables, num1, num2, num1, pi, and stir. So I am going to say, num1 is going to go in the first one, pi is going to go in the second one, and my stir is going to go in the final one. And my output is going to be, I'm 42, and it's 3.14 pi day, and it kind of is, but I didn't have pi today. So now I've got the same thing, except I've changed something. I've change the position of pi and my stir. So when I try and do it with that position, the output is going to be a syntax error because you cannot, you can't just put a string into a format specifier that's expecting a float. And that's what that f does. It says, I expect a float. And I'm going to take that float, and I'm only going to print two decimal places. So if you, it's positional. And um, so you have to be very careful about the position of the va variables that you're sending in to the format function. The format specifier much, must match the type. If you give it a type like F, it's got to match the type. OK. So this is the one and only time in the class I'm going to give you an answer. Um, we don't give you everything that you need to do Lab 2.12. You need to know, understand how to do what I started talking about in the beginning of this class, which is doing conditional stuff. We don't know enough to do if, elif, else yet, even though I was trying to, to explain that to you earlier. Lab 2.12 requires an if statement, and you can't do it without it. So. 
for all those who are in this class, for all those who watch the video, for all those who check the YouTube page, Lab 2.12, the answer is, it, there's a link to it in the description. Uh, I've told the school this. I told them this a long time ago. Sometimes they grumble. I don't worry about it. Um, so the, the answer is there for Lab 2.12. But we will go over it here anyway so that we can know how to read these in case we need to. So Lab 2.12 is many documents use specific format for a person's name. So you're going to write a program. The input is going to be one of two things. It is going to be first name, middle name, and last name. Or it's going to be last name, first initial, and middle, in it, dot middle initial. If the input has the form first name, last name, then the output is last name, first initial. So what we're dealing with here is an if statement. See that nice little blue diamond in the middle? That's the part that we haven't gotten to yet and we won't get to until the next week. So we're going to declare a name. We're going to input one of a couple of things. We're either going to input last name, first name, and middle name into it, or we're going to um, or we're going to just put first name and last name. So we're going to declare nameless. We're going to use a split here to split it into name it, nameless using a space delimiter. If the length of nameless is greater than two, then we're going to output last name of zero, last name of one of zero, sorry, and first name. I apologize, that one's wrong. And then we're going to, if it's not, then we're just going to output two things. So that diamond is what you don't have. So the lab is actually in the description, in the uh, um, link to the description. So for lab 2.13, we're going to write a program whose input is a string which contains a character and a phrase and whose output indicates the number of times a character appears in the phrase. So you're going to declare a string. And by the way, for those who didn't see this last week, flowcharts and next week's pseudocode are language agnostic. So there may be steps in here that you can combine, um, like declare a string and have the input all on the same line. So just be, just be wary of that. So you're going to declare a Meister, and then you're going to declare a my list. Somebody's going to input the string, and you're going to split it into my list. So you're going to have a string and a character, and you're going to have, I think it's space delimited, so you're just going to have a space in between the two. Now you want to declare character count, and then you want to set character count to the character count. So this is where we're going to use the dot notation on the string that is the second element in the list. Because when, when Zybooks gives it to you, it's going to be a character space and then a string. So you're going to want to split it and then use the first element in the um, list to check against the second element in the list and get the count. And then we're going to output the count. So those are the two labs for 2.13. So does anybody have any questions? I know I kind of went through some of this stuff fast because I messed up in the beginning. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to open up the mics. If not, then um, we will call it. I actually had a question about 2.14. Are you willing to address those? Sure. I'll address anything you want. Because I think I'm near the end, but it's it's saying that I'm having Oh, I didn't even go over this. My God. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So sorry. It, it's sorry. actually, the issue isn't with my logic, I don't think, but it's saying I have a lot of white space and um, also new line errors, but 
I've gone over this for like an hour and I cannot find it. Okay. Um, so it's it's saying um, on my for like the third fix me. It's saying that I have um, white space in within my solution for the number of characters. Um, for for both of the outputs, it's saying I have white space right before the colons and I've deleted it, put it back and it's still there. Yeah, Zybooks is a pain. Yeah, and I even I put it in PyCharm just so I could see it better. And PyCharm doesn't say I have white space at all. Yeah, um my suggestion take the thing in PyCharm. Then in Zybooks Literally select everything you can and delete the everything. Every right. comment they put in, everything. And then okay. copy the stuff from PyCharm back into Zybooks. Because sometimes Zybooks has strange characters. Right. Has invisible characters. I've seen this kind of stuff happen before. I've seen it happen where students have the exact right code, but they get one of those traceback errors. Right. It's super frustrating. It is massively frustrating. Um, so that that would be my suggestion. Um, and you're not, I don't think you're in my class, so contact your professor and let them know that you're getting these from Zybooks. I don't know how other professors grade. I always go back and look at my students' labs. So if, and I look at the results of anybody who didn't get a perfect grade, so if there's spacing errors only because Zybooks is a pain, I always give them back all the credit that Zybooks took away. So um, you should get full credit for this, but to try and mitigate any back and forth you might have to have with your professor, um, yeah, delete everything and start again. And I mean okay. just like take it from the very first and go as far down as iBooks will let you and just delete it. Sounds good. I appreciate it. No problem. I'm sorry you're having that problem. And so for everybody else, we'll go actually go over Lab 2.14. I completely forgot about it. Again, my brain is not in the right week. So basically this is a three-part lab and you're going to store, you're going to get uh, three separate variables. You're going to um, enter two words and a number. You're going to store them in separate variables, and then you're going to combine them. So this is where we want to do our string concatenation or our format specifiers, and the format specifiers would be easier. You're going to create two passwords in the format that they tell you, and then you're going to output the length of each password. So if we go here, what you'll see is this is basically you're just declaring some stuff. You're going to input it. You're going to declare password 1 and password 2. Then you're going to do your input and your output. And all of that is in section 2.7. If you go back to section 2.7, all you have to do is combine things properly and then out them and output them and then output the length. So that's what Jordan was talking about, everybody. And I apologize for, for being as scattered as I am. No worries. Does anybody else? Go ahead. No, I was just saying, it's no worries. I understand. <laughs> okay. It's been a long day. Sorry. Just a long day at work this week. Um Oh, um, you didn't miss? much Shweta. um I will yes I'm gonna if you want I'll put up the uh, URL to my YouTube um, so that you can see and there's a couple years worth of these videos um, I actually started on week three this week so you didn't miss much but let me for those of you who don't have the um here let me switch the youtube uh youtube uh you 
whoops, no, wrong one. Uh, your channel. So for those of you who um, can't come to these, this is the URL to the YouTube channel and what you'll find here is you will find videos. You will find videos for about the last three years for this class. Um, I redid the slides this year so la this, this year so last year's slides will look a little different. Um, but you can, there's playlists. So if you go to the playlists you can look at things by the term or you can look at them by like lecture one or lecture module one or module two or things like that. So that's all here. And also just so that, sorry about that, if you go and look at this one, Hello, it's not, and you look at the description, you will see links. Um, and these links are to all the challenges. By the way, if you're new and you weren't here last week, you are not required to do the challenges. The challenges are non-graded activities. I recommend that you do them, especially if you're having some issues or with a specific area. They're very helpful, but you are not required to do the challenges. You will do uh, the in the description, there's links to the Google Drive with the actual challenge Python scripts. There are links to any additional things, like um, maybe I'll be giving you something that's close to a lab that's very difficult. Um, and then you'll have the flowcharts for that week as well. So. Um, and starting this year, I'm putting up a PDF of the slides. So the slides will be up there as well, although they don't have any notes. So that's what you can find by just going through the description. Um, I hope that answers the question. That's okay, no problem. Everybody's new to everybody's new to programming at some point in their life. Some people, a very few people, take to it naturally. I did not take to it naturally. I love what I do, but I didn't take to it naturally at first. It was a struggle, and sometimes it still is. So don't feel bad about it being about you being new and it's not coming easily. It will come. It's more about teaching your brain how to think differently so that you can communicate with a dumb computer because computers are stupid. Um, so um, you'll get it. It just takes a little bit of time. So does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Then going once. Going twice. Everybody have a nice evening, and I promise next week I will start with the correct week. Have a nice evening, a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. No problem.